Uh, today's lecture is going to be all about, okay, we're not going to begin, spend the entire lecture talking about cats, but we're going to begin, begin by talking about cats. This is a continuation of the sequence, a series of lectures on convolutional neural networks. And uh, I hope to finish on time. I may just go a little over, right? So for the longest time, by the way, the, both of these are what are called gingers. And you might, if you have never uh, been informed, when a cat is a ginger, it's probably male. Anyway, uh, so for the longest time, people have been worrying about how do human beings see? How does sight work? And the basis of where convolutional uh, neural networks came from was basically from this question. Now, the, uh, for, for much of history, the manner in which we tried to understand vision was through the mechanics of it, what it does. So uh, basically, by studying behavioral judgment in terms in response to visual stimulation. Typically, they would study things like visual illusions. So how many of you here see a, see a cube over here? Do you see a cube? Right? So what is this? Is there a dog there? There is no dog, right? There's just a bunch of patches. What about this one? There is no panda, right? So, or in this case, this is particularly interesting. There is just, just a bunch of triangles, right? So, so your brain is making things up and filling in details that really aren't there, and somehow you're seeing things that, you, that aren't really presented to you. So, all of the study of uh, vision basically focused on gestalt, this, this business of making up things from, uh, you know, smaller stimuli is what is called gestalt. And gestalt sort of explains behavioral processes, but what about the underlying neural process? The first work to, on this was done by these guys, uh, Hubel and Wiesel, back in 1959, where certain types of uh, experiments were still considered ethical. This paper was called The First Study on Neural Correlates of Vision, Receptive Fields in the Cat Striate Cortex. Now, the human eye is an example of you know, bad design. So if there was a designer for the human eye, the guy didn't know what he was doing. You have the, the, the uh, uh, nerves in front of the retina, and the nerves have to fold back and punch through the retina to go to your brain, which makes no sense, which is why all of us have a blind spot. Then it doesn't stop there. The first step in the processing of uh, visual stimuli is not immediately adjacent to the eye. It goes all the way back to the back of your head. So those nerves have to sort of puncture through your brain and go, go to what is called the V1 region of your cortex. And then the processes come forward, backwards, and distribute through the brain. So the equivalent of this V1 in cats is what is called the cat striate cortex. It's called the striate cortex because all of the uh, nerves show a very striated pattern. And these guys tried to study it. This was back in 1959. They caught hold of 24 cats, some of which are clearly male. This one is female. You can make out. Anyway, huh? so, and they anesthetized them with uh, truth serum, put them on artificial respirators, and then opened their eyes and beamed light patterns on them. Now, they never mention in the paper whether they actually kill the cats, but then they do say if the brain, the, the brain tissue was studied, so I don't know how they did that. Yes? How do you know cats generate what they're looking at? It's genetic. So orange is a, a male-dominant trait, and this is a turtle shell. Turtle shell is a female-dominant trait. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> so here's what they did. They kept the eye open, and then they beamed a laser light like this up and down in various patterns and studied the response of individual cells in, this, in the striate cortex. And they can use this to study the immediate response on the, on the retina. And here's what they do. Uh, here's what they found. They found that you know, when you actually beam a light up and down, if the nerve responds, it means it's responding to the light, right? And they found that there are regions in the retina where if you have any light, it suppresses the response of the neuron in the brain. And there are regions, these are the inhibitory regions, just like we had way back in whose model was it? Anyone remember? Yeah. 
Mekalo and Pitts, right? And then uh, you have the excitatory regions. Now, if you have light falling on the inhibitory regions, it doesn't matter what's happening in the excitatory region, nothing happens. So if you have uniform light over the eye, the, the, the neuron will not respond. On the other hand, if you have light falling in the excitatory regions, but not in the inhibitory regions, then the neuron responds. So the, uh, the, the response of the neuron is what they call the receptive field, what it receives and what it responds to, have patterns like these in mice. Things must fall in the blue region, but not in the red region. It must fall here in the blue region, but not in the red region, and so on. And what do we observe? That the response of the individual neurons is somewhat linear. Different angles, but linear. So specifically, they found in their, in their paper that for the cats, this is what they found in, for one particular neuron. If they took a, a, a light and sort of beamed it left to right, there's no response at all. As they increase the angle towards 90 degrees, the number of spikes come, being emitted by the neuron goes up. At precisely 90 degrees, it's the largest, and then it begins to die off again. So clearly, this neuron responds to vertical patterns. More generally, they found that oriented slits of light were the most effective stimuli for individual neurons. So some of them might respond to something like this, others to this, others to this, but they were oriented slits of light for individual neurons. But then they found something very interesting in a later paper. You know, more cats were sacrificed to the, to the cause of science. And they found that even in the striate cortex, there were two levels of processing what they call the S cells, or the simple cells, and the C cells, which were the complex cells. Now, both of them responded in the same manner, but here's how it happened. Firstly, on the retina itself, the response of the retina has a somewhat circular, each retinal cell has a somewhat circular receptive field. So if you have a cell, uh, if you uh, have the, a specific location for a retinal cell, it responds to a circle of light around the current location, so it has a circular receptive field. The S cells connected to lines of these retinal cells, which is why the S cell would respond to linear or linearly oriented patterns. But then the S cells were sort of uh, uh, sensitive to noise. If you just had diffuse noise, that noise too could excite these things and the S cell could fire. So then you had these C cells, which actually looked at groups of these S cells. And the C cell itself would fire only as much as the most excited S cell that it was connected to. So in some sense, it was doing a max operation. It was cleaning up the operation of the S cells, making sure that signals were not lost, and it wasn't, they were not firing at random. So uh, the uh, overall structure is that you have alternating patterns of S cells, simple cells, which respond to, respond to uh, in the first, in the basic case, to linear patterns, and then C cells, which clean up the response of the S cells. They fine tune the response, and then as you go through a sequence of layers, S cell, C cell, S cell, C cell, the kind of patterns that these cells responded to got increasingly more complex. And so, basically, they showed this. Uh, kind of building up of more complex patterns by composing early neural responses. Now, this is where I lose interest in the experiments because subsequent experiments were on monkeys. And, uh, no. and just to add insult to injury, they said this model cannot accommodate color, spatial frequency, and many other features to which the neurons are tuned. So maybe the entire experiment was bogus, but anyway. So we have your first poll. Pardon me? Yeah. There's only one poll, right? So, okay, I'll stop it right here because it's a very simple question. I don't want to spend too much time on it. Uh, and the poll is open for 10 seconds more for the guys in remote locations. But we found that S cells find patterns and the C cells clean these up, right? 
Now, fast forward 20 years, uh, 21 years to Fukushima. That's where things, things stayed. There were a lot more exp biological experiments on vision. But then this guy, Kunuhiko Fukushima, who was considerably younger than this when this paper was, when this paper was published, realized something very interesting. Now, how many of you have heard of the Jennifer neuron, uh, Aniston neuron? You haven't heard of the Jennifer Aniston neuron? What was it, Ryan? It's a specific area of your brain that will fire if it's epileptic. There's not a specific area, a specific neuron. So uh, epileptic you know, patients of epilepsy are like a, a gold mine for uh, cognitive neuroscientists. They have, they have lesions in the brain. And these things have to be uh, repaired. So often they end up in surgery with their skulls opened, and they're just lying there in the hospital for several days on end. And then you know, along with these cog come these cognitive neuroscientists, ha, ah, here's a beautiful subject. They put a mesh on of uh, electrodes on the brain, and they can measure the response of individual neurons. And so now you have this poor epileptic patient lying there on the bed with their skull opened, and they put a mesh on it and begin showing pictures to these guys. And it, turned, it turns out that on one particular subject, there was one neuron that only fired if this person saw pictures of Jennifer Aniston. This is the famous Jennifer Aniston neuron. There's nothing special about Jennifer Aniston. It turns out that each of us have very specific neurons responding to very specific faces. And they call this the grandmother uh, neuron cell because all of us, almost all of us, who are familiar with mothers, fathers, and grandmothers, have at least have a cell somewhere in our head that responds only when we see our grandmother. Now, the thing is, it doesn't matter whether granny's out there or out there or directly in front of you, that cell is going to respond. So this position invariance is something that's not explained by this simple model here, right? And so Fukushima did two things. He sort of came up with a model that introduced position invariance and also came up with a computational model for the whole process. So here is his computational model. He says that the visual system consists of a hierarchy of modules. Within each module, you've got two pairs of two sets of neurons. The first one are the set of simple neurons, S cells. And the second ones are the set of complex neurons, the C cells that operate on the output of the simple neurons. And uh, so S cells respond to the signal from the previous layer. Each S cell responds to the neuron signals from the previous layer. And each C cell confirms the behavior of some S cells, right? Only the S cells are plastic. Only the, only the response of the S cells can be learned. The C cells serve a very simple purpose. They're, 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 their job is to confirm. So they have no learning aspect to it. Now, this is where the position invariance came in. Fukushima basically said that within each module, the S cells were arranged in a number of planes of this kind. And within each plane, you had an entire arrangement of cells, except with the, with the uh, uh, characteristic that all of the cells within an individual plane had the exact same response, identical responses. They would all respond to the same pattern. So what is the point of having so many cells? The point was that if you had an image, each of these guys would look at a slightly shifted location of the image in the previous plane. So that was how he def defined the S cells. And these different planes were looking for different patterns. Now, if an S cell pattern plane had an intervening region between itself and the eye, it's, and the eye, then it still looked at some region in the eye, but the way it did it was through the previous layer. So this S cell would look at, now if it wants to look at this region, this region is basically going into all of the planes in the previous layer, right? And so if this S cell wants to look at this region, correspondingly, it has to look at small regions in all of the planes in the previous layer. 
And specifically, they said that the response, the region that it was looking in, at was elliptical in shape. That was Fukushima's model. Now, the C cells are also organized in planes. But the C cells do something simpler. The C cells are organized in smaller planes than the S, S cell planes. And each C cell, whose only job is to confirm the response of S cells, looks at a small region in the S cell plane and just picks up the largest excitation and copies it over. So this was the entire structure of their network. You start off with the retina, that's U0. Then you have modules. Within each module, you have a plane, set of S, S planes and a set of C planes. All the S cells within any plane have identical response. An S cell is simultaneously looking at elliptical regions from all of the planes just before it, which is a C plane. And a C cell is simply looking at an elliptical region in the S, S plane that, is, that, it, that it's attached to. Now, this is, there's, there's no supervision over here. This is just the computational model, right? So how do you learn something from this? Uh, to explain learning, first you have to have some kind of an activation for all of the neurons. So he came up with a model for how the S cells respond. This very complicated looking equation was based on the study of the biology of the S cells itself. And similarly, he had a model for how the C cells respond to all of the cells within the ellipse. That too is based on the biology. And while these equations look kind of ugly, it turns out that these, this looks a whole lot like a ReLU. This just looks like a max, right? And so uh, this model is what he called the neocognitron. Clearly, when you call something the neo something, there must have been an earlier model. So there was a cognitron and there's a neocogn uh, the neocognitron, the neo version. And this is the entire model that he came up with. Now. Because the size of the regions, effective region on the eye that each cell looks at, keeps growing larger as you go through the network, the deeper the layer, the larger the receptive field of each neuron out on the, out on the eye. And so the complexity of the pattern that each cell looks at builds up hierarchically through the network. Now the C cell planes, which look at elliptical regions and, they, and they're just performing confirmatory analysis, they keep getting smaller. So because the C cell planes keep getting smaller, so do the S cell planes. And by the time you get to the end, these C planes are really small. Now, he came up with a learning mechanism for this. Now, you have all of these S cell planes. What is the learning mechanism? How are the, now again, remember the C cells only perform a max. The only cells that are performing useful activity are the S cells, right? So how do we uh, learn the S cells? Now, the way he defined it, if you consider any location in the retina, or this one connects to, or, and if you consider any specific location in each of the S planes, all of these will be connecting to the same point in the retina. So then he associated it with the plane that had the highest response at that location. And so once you associate it with the location that has the highest res response, then you can ignore these connections. And then he would update just the weight of this connection using Hebbian learning. Does anybody remember what Hebbian learning is? Raise your hands if you remember Hebbian learning. OK, one of you who didn't raise your hands. Somebody there, that lady there, right? What was Hebbian learning? Rucha. Pardon me? You update it as x, y, right? So you just say w equals w plus some eta times x, y. So you, he used simple thank you. So you, you could have raised your hand, right? <laughs> no. So he updates this using simple Hebbian learning. And then once he updates the weight over here, he's got to update the weights of all of these neurons correspondingly because all of them have the same response, right? And so. Now, because this, while this position may update this guy, there are other positions in the eye which are going where the remaining planes are going to have the max value. So eventually, all the planes get updated. But in, because of this max behavior, 
the planes begin to get specialized. So here's the kind of response behavior we found, he found happening. If you kept presenting many examples of say the character A, then the different one S plane might, find, might learn to respond to the right arm of A. Another might respond to the left arm. A third one to the horizontal arm, right? And so the next level, maybe you find more complex patterns. And then finally, when you get to the final level, final uh, layer of the, uh, uh, of the model, maybe you have cells that respond to a complete A. So he actually ran this entire experiment where, he, uh, Fuku, Fuku, where Fukushima presented this model with many examples of digits. And he found that in the uh, final layers, you, you had specific planes that responded only to the digit zero. You had other planes that responded only to the digit one, yet others that responded only to the digit two, regardless of the amount of noise in the image. So basically what was happening is, although there was no special supervision telling it, you must respond to the digit zero, even the concept of zero is not being presented. All that is being presented is a collection of images. The entire learning is unsupervised. Nonetheless, he found that by the time you get to the end of the model, the neurons actually begin to pick up individual concepts. And they only fire when a specific concept has been built through the complex sequence of layers. So, to pose. Ten seconds, guys. Okay, let me continue, right? So Fukushima's model is an unsupervised convolutional neural network, right? And it's unsupervised, but can we add supervision? So if I want to add supervision, how would you do it? Um, at the output, it's uh, cast down to a single neuron, right? And then we can compare it to a Thank you, right? So a neocognitron is a fully unsupervised model, right? We can add external supervision, as you just mentioned, and there were various proposals to it. The one that became, there were several people who actually came up with basically the same model. Jan Lekun just happened to be lucky as the one person who actually built a, uh, a software that could be distributed and so it became very popular. But here's the idea. I can have all of these neurons output to a single cell finally, and I can make it make that fi final neuron output something, and it can output class labels. And then if I output class labels, then over here I can have a desired class label, and I can back propagate the error to learn the, the responses of the individual neurons. Now I will no longer be using Hebbian learning, I'll be using standard gradient descent. And so this is the actual model. Now again, remember, the original neocognitron had many, 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 many uh, neurons in each plane, right? So over here you had, uh, in each, this plane would have had a bunch of neurons, each of them is looking at a slightly shifted region of the input. This is exactly the same as having a single neuron which is scanning the input. Computationally, it's no different, right? So the entire model has this structure except when you want to begin to learning, having elliptical fields and such like is, a, is kind of ugly. So you would imagine, you would assume square receptive fields rather than elliptical ones. The S-planes are going to have receptive fields of some size. Each S-plane neuron is going to be looking simultaneously at all of the planes in the previous layer. It's going to be looking at simultaneously at all uh, the identical regions to all of the planes in the previous layer, 
computing a weighted combination and then performing some activation on it. Each C cell neuron is going to be looking at a square region on the output of the previous S plane and picking up the maximum. So this is just Fukushima's model, nothing has changed. And uh, so this is uh, all we've done is add supervision to it. Now clearly if the C cell over here is trying to clean up the response of the S cells, then it makes sense for adjacent C cells to be looking at non-overlapping regions of the S planes, right? And so the C cell responses sort of have a stride that's greater than one when they are scanning the S planes. The actual uh, actor responses itself, each S cell neuron over here computes a weighted sum of, of all of the values that it's, that it's looking at in the previous layer. And then it applies an activation to it. And each C cell is simply picking up the largest of the values from the region that it's looking at in the previous layer. Now, you're gonna get one response at each location, right? Meaning you're gonna get one response at each of these locations over here. You could do them as an, a bunch of individual neurons, or you can just think of it as scanning with one neuron. And scanning is what Jan Lekun did in his paper. Now, to go back to what we had in the quiz and the question that someone here, I think Lavanya asked, what is the difference between a CNN and just scanning with an MLP? The only thing difference as, that, as I explained in the, on Piazza is the manner in which you perform operations. In CNN, instead of having a collection of neurons analyze the input all at once, you have one copy of the neuron scanning the input. The computational output effect is exactly the same. The act of scanning is called convolution. That's why, you're gonna, that's why we call it a convolutional neural network. And so here's the output that Tian Lekun got. He likes to have this demo. He like, had this demo on his website for the longest time. And this was on the MNIST database, handwritten characters. And when uh, Jan began working on this, the results were not all that great. And his CNN was some, some kind of a breakthrough. It was very, very accurate in uh, recognizing the characters. And the US Postal Services actually ended up using this, ended up using this uh, software, if I, if I remember right, which is one of the reasons it actually became so famous. Lenard, Lenard became very famous. Anyway, so here's the story so far. Mammalian, vision, the vi mammalian visual cortex consists of S cells, which capture oriented visual patterns, and C cells, which perform a majority vote over groups of S cells for robustness to noise and positional jitter. The neocognitron emulates this behavior with planar banks of S and C cells with identical response to enable position invariance. Only the S cells are learned. C cells perform the equivalent of max, or max over groups of S cell outputs. If you just perform simple unsupervised learning, you end up learning useful patterns. Lekun's LANET adds external supervision to the neocognitron. That's where this entire model comes from. So you have, once again, you have S planes of uh, cells with identical response, but this is now modeled by a scan, which is a convolution. And then C cells are emulated by cells that perform a max over a group of S cells. But once again, you can think of this as a max activation scanning the previous plane, right? This entire structure gives us a convolutional neural network. So here's the general architecture of a convolutional neural network. It comprises convolutional layers and downsampling layers. Convolutional layers are basically your S planes, where you have a learned response to the outputs from the previous planes. And the downsampling layers are basically your C planes, where at each position, you're aggregating a collection of outputs from the previous layer and picking the max. And because you're striding by a step that's greater than one, the resulting map is smaller. And so you call this downsampling. You're reducing the size. So you have uh, S planes and C planes. Now, they may occur in any sequence. It doesn't make sense to have multiple downsampling planes following one another. But having multiple S planes, multiple convolutional layers following one another makes perfect sense. And so a structure might be something like this, a convolutional layer followed by a downsampling layer, another convolution layer, downsampling layer, then two convolution layers, a downsampling layer. Any, any of these configurations is perfectly okay. This is just the basic idea being that you have downsampling layers, 
where you can have only one layer at a time because having groups of these makes no sense, and convolution layers, which can occur any number, in any number at any time, right? And so only the convolutional layers have learnable parameters. Downsampling layers just perform a max. There are no parameters to learn, yes, Jeffrey? So just a, yeah, it's just doing a max, right? That is a pulling layer. Now, what about the convolution layer? A convolution layer consists of a series of maps which correspond to the S-planes. They're often called feature maps or activation maps. And then if you look at any one map, it's got a collection of positions, right? And at each, so but each of these values, but at each location there are two operations being performed. First is an affine combination of all of the values it's looking at. So as a first step, you would be computing a weighted sum, an affine function of its inputs. So this is what we call an affine map. And followed by, and then you have a pointwise application of an activation function to, to every, lo every location on the affine map, and that's going to give you the final output. You get an activation map. And these affine maps are the ones that have learnable filters associated with them. Right? Now, if you consider the affine map, at each position, all of the maps in the previous layer contribute to the uh, affine, affine computation. So let's consider what the contribution of a single map over here. If I want to find out how this particular map contributes to the computation of this map, here's what it would look like. Now this, I'm, I don't remember who I stole this video from. But then imagine that I have this, this, this one in orange over here is my green map over here. Assume that all of the values are binary, ones and zeros, right? And now, if I want to compute any location over here, again, remember what is happening. If I want, I've got this map from the previous layer, and in the next layer map, I want to compute a single location this guy is going to be looking at a region in the previous layer, right? And this region is going to have a collection of values. So it's going to be summing all of these values, but there will be a weight associated with each value. It's going to compute a weighted sum. And so this picture over here in orange shows you the arrangement of weights, which as we know by now is called, called a filter. And so when you want to perform the computation, Here's what you would do. You would place the filter maybe on the top left corner. So the numbers in red show you the filter values. The numbers in black are the map values. And then you would be multiplying the filter value by the map value at each location, and then summing the lot. So here it's going to be 1 times 1 plus 1 times 0 plus 1 times 1 plus 0 times 0. If you sum it all up, that's going to be the value 4. right? And then you shift forward, if my video will work, and you perform the computation at each location. Basically, it's the identical computation at each location, where at each location, you're going to be multiplying each pixel with the corresponding weight value, summing the lot, and, per, and you can also have an additional bias. Over here, I've assumed the bias is zero, but again, it's an affine function, so there can be an additional bias. Now, this only shows the contrib uh, contribution of a single map, by the way, right? And here again, when you perform the computation, I'm assuming that you're moving forward one pixel at a time. You could move forward two pixels at a time, I mean two locations at a time. So you could have a computation like this. And when you stride forward by more than one, the output map is going to be a smaller size, right? Now that just showed you what have, how a, an individual map in the previous plane contributed to a current plane. The actual computation is a lot more complex so if you want to compute this plane, this plane is considering all of these guys, not just one of them. So the filter is not just going to be one. If, if you were looking at three cross three regions of the previous plane, the filter is not merely going to be just one arrangement of three cross three numbers. There's going to be one such set of weights corresponding to each one of these maps in the previous layer. So if these pictures over here represented the orange maps, you're going to have one. So you have several maps in the previous layer. And I want to compute the first affine map of the next layer. Then corresponding to this first affine map, I'm going to have a filter. 
the filter will have, if, if my filter is three cross three, the, the filter is going to have one three, three cross three arrangement of weights correspond, corresponding to each one of these guys. And that three cross three is going to be placed on the maps like so. Then you would perform a pointwise multiplication of the weights in the underlying image and sum the lot and you get one value, right? And then you would step forward, perform the same computation for the second and this next location, get the, the, get the next value. And so this is the actual computation that you would be per performing to compute this entire affine map. Yes, Maximum? So the total number of, wait a minute, so. So, yeah. So now suppose I want to compute the next map. That is, that is just for one map, right? This is answering your question, Maxwell, right? If I have another map, corresponding to the next map, I'm going to have a second filter. And the second filter is going to have one, three, cross three for every one of the input maps, right? And so this guy, the second filter is what is going to be placed over here on the input maps to compute the corresponding output map, right? Is this clear to everybody? May I see you raise your hands so I know that, okay. If no, someone ra doesn't raise your hands, you're going to be in for the next question. Now, that's a threat, huh? So here's a different way, way of viewing it. This, is, this sort of actually explains what's going on. It should be very obvious. But then there's a, this, uh, there's a more convenient way of viewing the whole thing. I have several of these yellow maps, right? Instead of placing them one below the other, let me stack them up into a cube. They're all the same size. So I could stack them up into a cube like this, right? If I stack them up into a cube like this, then all of these filters, uh, the, all of the, the filter maps for, you know, the, the little, uh, filter maps for each one of these planes, those two can be stacked into a cuboid, correct? And now I can think of the convolution as just placing this cuboidal filter on the stack of maps, performing a pointwise product and summing the lot. And, that, and then finally, there's of course a bias term that I would add, and that's going to give me the affine value at that location. And so when I scan, you know, this is the entire operation at each location. First, I'm summing over one of the planes. That's the inner sum. And that's, that summation is being performed over all of the planes. And then I sum the entire lot and also the bias. And that is going to give me this one computation. And I can perform this computation at each location to fill up my map. So that's the that's just a different way of, way of viewing it, but it sort of explains the operation pretty clearly, right? And so now the uh, size of the output over here may not be the same as the size of the input. There's a reason for this, and this has to do with how we deal with boundaries. Now consider this guy. This input over here was five cross five. The output was three cross three. Why the difference? Anybody? Maybe Samia, you can tell me. How is it reducing it? Yeah, you Jeffrey? You are not allowing the filter to go across the boundary, correct? So you're going forward here. And so one, two, three, and then after that, you fall off the edge. If I had a step, if I had a stride of two, I only get two in the output because if I go beyond two, I fall off the edge. Now, suppose uh, I have in general a filter of size m cross m, and my image is size n cross n, what is the size of the output going to be, James? Uh, it's going to be, yeah. Correct, I have the output on the slide. Thank you, <laughs> very clever, right? But why? <laughs> That's a harder question, it's not on the slide. 
OK, let me explain, right? So if I have a, a, an n cross, suppose this width is n, and my filter is size m, how many, what is this? n minus m. So I, I can shift forward n minus m times, and then I have this one position in the corner, right? That's why it's going to reduce to size n minus m plus 1 along both dimensions. Now suppose I have a stride greater than 1, then what's going to happen? James, maybe you can tell me. Um, so stride, stride minus how, many, how many steps, output steps, am I going to be able to take forward in this n minus m? Plus 1, right? For the current position. So that's the size of the output map, right? There's a floor value. This making sense to everybody? Now, Kunal, if I didn't want, so this is going to reduce the size of the output map. But suppose I want the output to be the same size as the input, then what would I do? Pardon me? You can add dummy values to the edges. And what's a good dummy value, anybody? Zeros, right? So what I can do is just pad zeros all around. How many zeros would I pad? It's going to, the, the number of zeros I pad is going to be n minus, n minus n minus n plus 1, right? That's how many rows I lost, or that's how many columns I lost. So I'm going to add those many zeros. And I'm going to distribute them uniformly, symmetrically on either side of my input to make sure that the size is not lost. And then uh, you can continue. So this convolutional operation, so is all of this clear to everybody? Yes? Do we always do center at center of the filter? Do we always center at middle? So that's just, that's, uh, just convention, right? Whether you want to use the top left corner, the bottom right corner, the center, as your basic index is a matter of convention. The output doesn't change. That's just the indexing. Yes, Soren? There you would have a flip. But it doesn't really matter, right, as far as we are concerned. You can think of the, the filter as the flipped version of this guy. And it doesn't, this is more like a correlation rather than a convolution. Okay. And then it just works out. It just works. It's just terminology at some point, right? Yeah. So, so the output of the convolution layer is to give you this affine map. Where you, yeah. How do I determine the size of the filter? We'll get to that in a bit, right? I don't determine it. That's where you get into heuristics. So actually, yeah. repeat that question in 20 minutes. Yeah. Pardon me? So n is what I want. I have n minus m minus n minus m plus one outputs coming out, right? So if I subtract this from this guy, how what is the remaining number? M minus one. If I don't want the size to reduce. So I just have some uh, pseudocode. I don't have time for it. I'm going to skip. Okay. Now these convolution layers are followed intermittently by downsampling or what are called pooling layers. Typically, you know, what the original Lekun model did and what Fukushima's model did and to some ex extent was biologically motivated in the sense that you said the C cell is trying to clean up the response of the previous neural player. So you're going to pick up the largest value. But you don't have to be motivated like by biology. Like somebody said, a famous scientist once said, aeroplanes don't flap their wings. So you, know, you don't want to imitate biology to the limit. You want to do something that's perhaps motivated by it. So you can do something besides the max. But what is this operation itself? Here's what the max operation looks like. You have a region that you're looking at. And it's going to select the largest of these values. So for example, when I'm performing a max pooling, if this region is 3, 1, 4, 6, the largest value is 6. So that value is going to be copied over. Then you'd stride forward, 
And once again, the largest value is 6, so that value is going to be copied over, right? Now, observe that in my little example, I'm assuming that the stride is 1. In Lekun's model and the original biological model, the stride was not 1 because you said that adjacent C cells were looking at non-overlapping region. Oh, my good God. I'm out of battery, so can somebody get me a laptop? with an HDMI. <laughs> this thing just has to happen, right? This is going to die any moment. In the meantime, somebody will find me a laptop and just pull up the slides from the course page. Anyone have a laptop? With... This doesn't usually happen. Today it's really misbehaving. Right? Anyway, so you have HDMI? OK, put this in. Oh, shit. <laughs> the remote guys are lost. They're screwed. We don't have Zoom on. Media tech. So re remote folks, <laughs> your class just ended. OK, just we'll leave it as a. Can you pull it up on full screen? It's in the, uh, the PowerPoint. It is in the PDF form. Anything is fine. Just want us. I want this to work. Oh, this works. Leave it. Right. OK, so here's what we're going to do, right? Uh, can somebody just apologize to the guys on the remote? And I'll say that I will actually record this separately on Zoom for them. Yeah. No. That's MediaTek, right? So the Zoom guys can't see it. Anyway. Uh, so the way we are doing it over here, and this is not a very good animation, clearly, is uh, you're assuming that things are moving forward one pixel at a time, one position at a time, whereas the biological model didn't necessarily do that. But once you're beginning into compu computation, you don't really have to worry about the business of strides, right? Uh, this, is, this is disconcerting. There's got to be a way of doing this. Does anybody know how to make the PDF just? Where's that? Single page? That's what it says. Hello? That's OK. Maybe I'll just do this. OK. You get the idea, right? So. I have the pooling layer. <laughs> Let's continue with whatever we've got. So the pooling layer basically doesn't, doesn't necessarily have to stride one step at a time. Or to, or, uh, but uh, the way we've shown it, I've shown it, it's sort of striding one step at a time. More typically, when you, the pooling layer is going to stride by something more than one, because it is called a downsampling layer after all, right? So if you've already picked up, if you've already cleaned up one region of the input, maybe the next region you want to consider is not overlapping. And so pools tend to have strides, which are a significant portion of the size of the window itself. Often they will not overlap. And so the one thing about pooling layers is that for pooling, you typically will not zero pad because it makes no sense. The zeros are not going to get picked more often than not, right? or even if they get picked, they are basically uninformative. They're useless. So pooling layers will typically stay within the uh, region that you're looking at. And so the output of the pooling layer is going to be just this and not the, the zero padded version of it. Okay. Now, if you look at what pooling is doing over here, so I, again, I have the uh, pseudocode, skip that. Pooling is picking the largest value in a, in, in a set. You can perform other operations which are almost picking the largest value. So for example, when you pick the p-norm of the set of inputs, you'd be saying, I'm going to say, so there are, you'd be picking the average of the values raised to p and taking the pth root of it. As p tends to infinity, this is just going to end up picking the largest value. If p becomes 0, or p becomes 1, this is just going to take the average, right? So you can have any kind of, so you have the entire range of operations. You might say 
I don't want to just pick the largest value. I want to take the average of all of these guys or something in between the two. And you have those operations possible. You can do something uh, even more fancy, which is to say, you could say, I'm going to learn how to combine these guys into my final output, which means that you would have a little pooling network which looks at these four guys and picks out one value, makes the final prediction, and then it scans with this scans the network with this pooling, uh, with this learned pooling operation. And once you begin, and this was what was called a network in network, but once you begin going into learned pooling operations, you might as well drop the whole pooling business and simply have convolutions with larger strides. And that too is going to perform downsampling, right? And so. These are all the various op uh, variations that you can have for pooling, where the downsampling itself, you can actually be looking at regions and picking the maximum, or you can be picking some version of an average which is between an exact average and a maximum. You can learn the response, how to pick, uh, how to compute a value from a set to get this position, this jitter invariance, or you can dispense with the whole thing and just have a network that has only convolution operations end to end with strides uh, that might be greater than one. So when you have uh, a network that has only convolution operations end to end, they like to call this an all convolution network. So in these networks, again, this is going to sort of follow the, uh, the uh, model that we've, we've, we've spoken of earlier in the last class. You just have convolutions going all the way through without any pooling layers. Again, remember, pooling too is just a form of convolution except the operation is nonlinear, right? That is, that is dispensed with. And then the final outputs of the final maps are passed on to whatever decision process that you finally have. Now, we have a poem. Uh, Eight sixty five and eight sixty six. Okay, 10 seconds, guys. The ones on Zoom are missing this. This is kind of tragic. We were supposed to have a separate Zoom. The Zoom was not supposed to go off my laptop. This is technical problems in the room. Okay, oh, let me continue. Questions, anybody so far? Yes? It is a, the pooling operation has entirely to do, it started, started off as a, a computational you know, representation of a biological process. And uh, computationally, the pooling operation's primary purpose is actually to uh, give you some kind of uh, uh, jitter invariance, as we saw, uh, as we mentioned in the last class. The learning process itself remains unaff uh, unaffected, as, as we'll see in the next class. In fact, learning becomes a little of, it's a little more challenging when you're performing pooling because pooling operations don't have clean derivatives. Yes, Jeffrey? Uh, you mentioned that uh, pooling will have neural features beyond specialized. So max pooling is, gives you some kind of uh, jitter invariance in this model, right. but, but, but in the unsupervised, uh, the max pooling didn't give, give you uh, specialized features. The, uh, the uh, Hebbian learning, which had, which had the maximum association with the largest response across planes, gave us the specialized uh, uh, patterns in the, in the neocognitron. But once we come up here, that, 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 that doesn't hold anymore. Now we're looking at supervised learning, yes? Uh, 
It's not specializing anything. Now, again, we are not max pooling and mean pooling are not specializing response. So this, the specialized response was something else. If you go back to the Fukushima model, we then over there we said, you know, in response to any input, you would pick the largest across the planes, right? So that's why the one that had the largest response keeps getting augmented, and so each of these planes ends up learning a different feature. Max and mean pooling are basically saying um, they're, they're the equivalent of the C cells. They are cleaning up the response of the previous layer. So, so they're saying, I've got this collection of responses. Based on this collection of responses, what is the trusted response? And the trusted response could be a max, it could be a mean, it could be anything in between. It's the pooling layer is doing a cleaning up job. Making sense? You don't sound convinced. That had nothing to do with pooling again, right? So that had to do with this guy. Over here, when I said, when we were looking at the Fukushima model, going back to the earlier model, we said that if I got some input, I used it only to update the response of one of these planes, a, a different neuron. This is going across neurons. Remember? Within each neuron, you're always picking the largest value. There's a cleanup job. So the pooling has nothing to contribute to specialization of the responses. It's just cleaning up. Anything else? Any other questions, guys? Yeah. Why do Because if your stride is greater than one, then the output is smaller than the input, isn't it? So what is going on here? The Diksha, don't tell me your laptop has died too. Okay. So uh, there, if I have, I have to move on, but if I've got something of this kind, I'm going to get a response at each location, am I not? I would reduce it at the boundaries, that's it, okay. But there's no systematic reduction in size. So if I have a large input, regardless of whether I have a large input or a small input, the reduction is just by the width of the filter. Whereas when I've got a larger stride, it's by a factor, right? It's proportional. So that's why it's downsampling. All right. Now, there was a poll. So the fully convolution uh, neural net is identical to a scanning MLP with distributed representations. Do you agree? Right. Raise your hands if you agree. And how many of you didn't get that? Uh, question. Yes. Uh, but like scanning MLP doesn't have that uh, pooling stuff, right? So that's why I said a fully convolutional layer. Oh. Network, right? This is a fully convolutional network is a shift invariant pattern detector, obviously also, right? It's you're dealing with the grandmother, your grandmother cell to begin with. And so here's the story so far. A CNN is a supervised version of a computational model of mammalian vision. It includes convolution layers comprising learned filters that scan the outputs of previous layers, and downsampling by pooling layers that vote over groups of outputs from the convolution layer. The convolution can change the size of the output. This can be controlled by zero padding. Pooling layers may perform maxes, p norms, or be learned, and they basically downsample the input. Convolution layers with stride greater than one can also perform downsampling. These are all the lessons so far. Now let's put everything together in a typical image task, right? Let's consider the problem of classifying color images. Now in a color image, a color image is not just a matrix of numbers, it's a collection of matrices. So if I have a color image of this kind, you'd find that within the image itself, you have the red map, the, the red image, the green image, and the blue image that typically presented, it, presented to you as RGB. And if you want to analyze the image, you must look at all of the colors because there's different information in the different colors. So typically what you would do is you would say that, you'd say that the input consists of three pictures over here. I can stack them. And so now 
my input itself is a stack of images, right? And now as the first S layer, the first convolution layer, I'm going to begin scanning the stack of images with, uh, with, a, with a bunch of filters. So we can skip this. So here's your input. You have an input which is three pictures. I'm going to have corresponding, corresponding to every one of these planes, I'm going to have a different filter. So here, for example, if I decide to have four output planes, I'm going to have four filters. Now each filter is going to be a cuboid. It's a cuboid because it's going to be looking at, remember we just sort of stacked all of the planes in the previous layer together into a cube, right? So each filter over here is looking at a small region in each of these guys. So you can stack all of those filter maps together and each filter is also a little cuboid. And so if I have decide to have K of these output maps in, in any layer, I'm going to have K filters, one per K cuboids, one per map, so K filters, right? Now these filters, when you have distributed representations, how do I decide the size of the filter? It turns out that you want to distribute your representations over as many layers as possible and eventually make the filters as small as, as, as you can just to ensure that you're capturing information at all scales. So if you stop at say five, or five cross five, then you're never going to go below five cross five in scale uh, in terms of uh, capturing repeated patterns. So typically we like to have filters as five cross five, three cross three, or even this bizarre one cross one. What do you mean by one cross one? Can anybody, anybody tell me? Yeah. It's a dot, it's a dot right? So, these five cross five are small enough to ca capture fine features. And this one cross one is just looking at a dot, right? Now when I'm looking at a dot across all of these guys and scanning with a single dot, what did we call this in the last class? Anybody want to tell me? Aishwarya, what would you call this? Pardon me? It's a fully, no, but there was something else. This was, we were speaking of the difference between distributed and undistributed responses, right? If I was looking at a single position on across all of the maps, is that a distributed representation? No, right? So this is a, this is a layer where the representation is not being distributed. You have an undistributed representation at this one point, whereas if you've got filters which are looking at larger regions, you're sort of distributing the representation across multiple layers. So this is a non-distributed layer and the scanning map. And, and if you actually wanted to represent the whole thing correctly, I'm gonna, you know, a better notation is going to say five cross five cross three because the images, the maps are five cross five. I mean, the filters are five cross five and I have three maps that they must operate on. So the total number of parameters for this filter is gonna be 75, 25 times three, right? Now, how many filters do we have? Now this is mechanics. Typically it turns out that we like to have uh, filters that are powers of two. Now here's something very uh, interesting that, that that kind of matters. When I begin performing computations, right? I like not to lose information as I go through the layers. So, if I've got some map over here, and if my filter is, say, two cross two, it has four parameters in it, right? So what is happening over here? I'm compressing four values into one. If I don't want to lose that information, how many filters must I have? Four, right? because that's going to give you four equations over four values, all of the information is being reta retained. Suppose I have a downsampling layer and I'm having a stride of two. How many filters must I have to retain all of the information? Right? So here, let's go back here. Suppose this depth, remember I'm looking at a collection of maps, so, so if I've got a depth of k in the first position, or if I've got a depth of d in the first position, and if I'm striding, 
striding by a factor of two, what happens? I'm beginning to lose information as I go forward, correct? The number of filters is going to be two cross two cross D. That's how many I'm going to need to, to make sure that I keep all of the information. If my stride is large, I have to increase the number of filters to retain all of the information. If my stride is greater than the width of the filter, is it possible for me to retain all the information? Some things are simply being lost, right? So typically what will happen is that as you go through the layers, you start with a small number of filters, then you keep doubling the number of filters to try to retain as much information as you can about the input in the representation. Now, that's going to give you, so the parameters you would choose over here are going to be, you know, what is the size of the filter, the span, and how many filters you will have. And also the stride, if you choose to have a stride you know, greater than one. Now, you also have to decide whether you want to zero pad the input or not, depending on whether you want to retain the size of the input. There are many situations where you'd like to retain the size of the input, specific, particularly if you're trying to do any kind of image segmentation and you want to lo localize objects within the image. Then you want to retain the size because if you begin losing the edge, then your ability to gauge the exact location of some pattern and the input based on the output is going to be compromised. And the exact operation that you're performing for all of these planes is that in, within each plane, you would be doing two steps of operations. The first one is you compute this affine value. We've seen this equation before. This affine value is basically computing a weighted sum of all the filter values with its corresponding underlying uh, you know, map value and then summing, summing the lot and also the bias. And the second step is for computing an, an activation on the output. That's going to give you the bias. So the learnable parameters are going to be all the parameters on the filters. So if you've got an L cross L filter and it's looking at three images, R, G, and B, so you've got L cross L parameters for R, L cross L parameters for G, and L cross L parameters for, for B, right? So the filter is going to have three L squared plus one. The plus one is for the bias. So these many parameters for each filter. And so if you have, if you have say, K1 filters, every one of these filters is going to require three L squared plus one to parameters to learn. And so that's how many parameters you're going to have in this layer to learn the model completely. Now, once you're past this map, the next thing that you will do is, if you, have a, if you have a max pooling layer or any kind of pooling layer, you're going to perform a pooling and the pooling looks at some region of the input. Now remember that while these guys look at the entire cube, they look at all of the maps in the previous layer. Pooling is just like the C planes over here, right? So a pooling, a pooling uh, operation looks only at one of these maps. It's not going to look at all of them simultaneously. So this pooling operation is going to be looking at regions of just this output map. And what you will do is typically be looking at little P cross P blocks and picking maybe the largest value if you're performing max pooling to compute the output. And then you'd have some stride. You perform the pulling, you take some stride, you perform the pulling, and then you take some stride. So to compute the output at any location, ij, you would, so, to comp so when you're performing pulling, this, since this thing is reduced, to compute the location at any ij, the first thing you need to do is to find which region of the input you're pulling at. And that's this guy over here, x win, y win. And then within that region, you pick the largest value and copy it over to that specific position, right? Now, this operation itself is not going to be done in one step, not just picking the largest value. What you will non normally do is, well, so again, there are all the, the parameters you have to choose over here is how large the window is over which you're going to pull and what is the stride. But the more important thing is that the operation is not going to be performed in one step. You won't just pick the largest value and copy it over. As we'll find in the next class, it is important to, do, to know which location 
in the input the maximum value was copied from. The reason for this is that, now let's say this pooling layer, I'm just going to zoom in on this. I was looking at this region and I picked the max value, and let's say the max value was this guy, right? Would jittering any of these guys change the output here? So what would the derivatives here be? Zero, right? So to know what derivatives to fill in over here, you need to know which location the max came from, right? And so we perform this in two steps. In the first step, we find the location of the maximum. You store the information going forward. In the second step, you copy the value of the maximum from that location. And so you'll be performing max pooling individually on each of these maps, and you get your collection of pooled maps. So assuming that, so moving on, I'm just going to stack all of my max pooled layers into a cuboid again. And then this is just my first set of operations, right? Convolution and max pooling. Is it Shurya? Not during pooling, right? Pooling, you have one per plane. Pooling loses information. That's why before you pool, right, you would increase the size of the input just to make sure that the net information is not lost. You have redundancy. Is that making sense? So the doubling of filters would happen out here before the pooling, and then the pooling is going to bring things back in. So the information is retained. Now, you may actually want to lose information if there's a lot of spurious junk in your data, in which case you'd, sort of, you'd still want to control how much information is being lost. But in that case, typically, you're going to end up with fewer values than the, than the input itself. Nonetheless, for the most bit you like, if you want to retain information, you have to make sure that the total number of terms you're computing doesn't shrink. Right. So once we do this, OK, jargon over here. Filters are often called kernels. This is what you, you might have encountered in your homework. And the outputs of the individual filters are often called channels. So here, for example, I have K1 channels. I have three channels going in. I have K1 channels coming out. And again, I have K1 filters. So because I have K1 filters, I have K1 channels coming out. right? Or I have K1 kernels, I have K1 channels coming out. Or Alternately, people like to say this one filter with K1 output channels. So all of these are different term ways of, of talking about the same thing. If you encounter it, don't get confused. Then, of course, once you've got the first set of pooled outputs, you'd have a second set of filters, which is maybe some, sub, some K2 of these cuboids again. right? So the cuboids are going to be some size, L3 cross L3. If you have K2 of those, then the total number of parameters is going to be K2 times L3 cross L3. Those operations would scan the set of pooled output maps. And you're going to get, if you have K3 of these filters, you're going to get K3 affine maps coming out. On each of these, you'd be applying your activations. And so you're going to have K3 maps coming out from that point. And so now the parameters to choose is going to, are, are going to be you know, how many filters, what is the span of the filters, what is the stride? Again, all of these things are design choices. And there are a lot of terms over here, you know, things that we should just sort of toss out uh, because there's no nice rigorous way of saying this is what the value must be. So these are all to be determined purely empirically. So these are the number of parameters that we'd have to learn. And then from those, you'd have some other pooling operations so that the map, you'd, you'd retain the number of maps, but the sizes would go down. You'd have, and each time you perform, com, perform a convolution, you have to decide on the number of filters and the size of the filter and the stride. Each time you perform a pooling, you're going to have to decide what is the size of the pooling area you're looking at and what is the stride. These are all design choices. You keep performing these operations until eventually you're going to say, I'm done with my convolutions, I'm done with my pooling operations. I have a collection of maps, and I'm going to analyze this collection of final maps 
which will typically be very small because you kept reducing the size as you went through, right? And, you're going to, you, and you want to look at these guys and decide if the pattern that you're looking for is present. So at that point, you might just put the whole thing through a simple softmax, or if you want to be fancy, which is often not worth the effort, you put the collection of those through an MLP by itself. Right? You have a bunch of numbers. Those numbers can be dealt with anyhow, and that can, those can be put through an MLP. And so uh, just some closing uh, bits of information. Each convolution with stride one typically maintains the size of the image. With zero padding, it will not change at all. Now, each convolution layer will generally increase the number of maps from the previous layer because you want to retain the information. You want to account for the fact that if you're downsampling, you're reducing the size of the maps. If you want to reduce the size of the maps, you want to increase the number of the maps so that the information is retained. And so typically, uh, each convolution layer will increase the number of maps from the previous layer. Each pooling layer with stride D decreases the size of the maps by a factor D. And filters within a layer must all be the same size, but the sizes may vary from layer to layer. So you, know, you might have filters of size 1, 2 cross 2 in the first layer, 3 cross 3 in the second, and so on. Yeah? So, the, so we can, that's what I said. You can completely eliminate pooling by just having convolution with stride greater than one, right? That would be an all convolution network. Pardon me? So the pooling is a, has a historical reason. It came from the original biological model. Also, pooling doesn't, you know, uh, if you just want to perform convolution with larger numbers of strides, you'll, find, you'll end up with more numbers of parameters. That's all. So you're in trying to introduce jitter invariance, and pooling is a cheap way of doing it. But these days, in most models, you don't really have pooling layers. You just have convolutions through and through. So the number of parameters you'd have to choose are basically the number of convolution and downsampling layers. For each convolution layer, you want to know how many filters there are, how large they are, what their strides are. For each pooling layer, you need to know what is the size of the region within which you're looking and what is the stride. And then you'd have a final MLP. You have to make all the decision choices, design choices about the final MLP itself. We'll skip this poll. Now, just this, we'll get to the answer. The relationship between the number of channels in the output of a convolution layer and the number of neurons in the corresponding scanning MLP. These are the same thing. Right, because the, the neurons in the scanning MLP are each producing a map. So each neuron is basically representing one filter or one output channel. So how do you train this? We're going to get, spend a lot more time in the next class on training the model. This is a very complicated model, right? Or is it complicated? It turns out not really. So the training is going to be very straightforward for the MLP region of the of the network. You have some data coming in. You perform a bunch of computations. And over here, you have a collection of numbers which go through the MLP. The MLP produces a final output. You have some labels, which are the target output. So you can compare the labels with the final output. And then you can actually uh, pass the derivatives backwards. So you can, you can perform backdrop all the way to the input of the MLP itself. And from there, we have to perform backpropagation backwards through the pooling layers and through the convolution layers. And we have to figure out how those parameters must be estimated. Right? And so that is what we want. We have to learn the weights of the neurons. Basically, the parameters we have to learn are the, are the weights of the neurons in the final MLP and the weights and biases of the filters in the convolution layer. And that whole thing is going to require back propagation. We'll get through that in the next class. I'll stop right here. Any questions? I'm sorry for rushing through the final few minutes, but we lost time. <laughs>